Welcome to the National Press Club, the world's leading professional organization for journalists. I'm Michael Friedman, the 113th president of the National Press Club. I'm the former general manager of CBS Radio Network, now journalist in residence at University of Maryland Global Campus and executive producer of the Kalb Report public broadcasting series moderated by Marvin Kalb. We thank you for joining us today for our virtual headliner book event with journalist Paul Dixon, author of The Rise of the G.I. Army, 1940 and 1941, the forgotten story of how America forged a powerful army before Pearl Harbor. In 1939, the year Adolf Hitler invaded Poland, the United States had just 120,000 men in uniform. Two years later, the American Army numbered more than 1.5 million with a spit-polished new officer corps. Paul Dixon's book details that remarkable transformation from President Franklin Roosevelt's inspired appointment of General George Marshall as Chief of Staff of the Army to the Louisiana War Games that gave Generals Dwight Eisenhower and George Patton invaluable insights into the war they would now command. Even the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Depression-era Tree Army, had a role. He tackles the politics of a controversial peacetime draft in 1940 amid isolationist sentiment and the implications of a universal draft that included black Americans. Kirkus Review called Dixon's book one of the best treatments to date of America's rapid transition from the Depression to the wartime power it became. And the New York Times called reading the book a profoundly heartening experience. With all they are facing today, Americans need Dixon's reminder of this momentous accomplishment. Paul Dixon began his journalism career in ninth grade by interviewing America's first news anchor, CBS Radio Network's Robert Trout, who announced the news of the Japanese surrender 75 years ago today. Paul's first professional journalism endeavor, which he sold to the New York Times, was a travel piece on the newly independent nation of Malta. Since then, he has written more than 65 nonfiction books on everything from baseball to Murphy's Law. And we're proud to say that Paul is a valued and engaged member of the National Press Club. Paul, thank you for being with us virtually today. Thank you, Mike. It's really a pleasure. We will accept questions from the audience. I'll ask as many as time permits to submit a question. Email us at headliners at press.org. Paul, let's, um, let's actually begin today, uh, which is the 75th anniversary of VJ Day, the day the Japanese surrendered, effectively ending World War II. And I want to get to the underpinnings of your book, but would you mind starting with your reflections on this day, particularly in reference to the subject of your book? Well, the, the fact that we had... Um, the fact that we were able to develop this army uh, before before Pearl Harbor made it made us able to react to a two ocean war, which was be, the, uh, began really uh, to a large degree with land forces in uh, in Europe, but then of course in Asia, and so th this was the actual end of the war. It was the final victory, and. Um, if we hadn't built this army before Pearl Harbor, if we hadn't done that and hadn't developed this phenomenal officer corps, uh, we would have been in terrible, terrible, terrible shape. In fact, George, Mar George C. Marshall, who was, who was then chief of staff of the army said after the war, without this pre-war uh, creation of this army and this training of this army and giving it a mobility and giving it leadership and giving it morale, uh, the war could have gone on considerably longer, perhaps 1945, 1950, uh, and it would have cost millions more lives, both of, of, of American lives, but also civilians and of, of the enemy. Uh, so so um, the ref my, my reflection now on this day is, thank goodness we had George C. Marshall, thank goodness we had Dwight D. Eisenhower, thank goodness we had Franklin D. Roosevelt, Thank goodness we had a civilian named Grenville Clark, who very few people have heard of, but he's the one who got the peacetime draft of 1940, got the legislation created and passed, and be, and 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 be, get this this peacetime draft, which is 80 years old, in first week in September, 80 years ago, 
So there's a whole lot of heroes that swim in my head today. Thank you. Your book explains how, in an extraordinarily short period of time, the U.S. created this army from next to nothing in order to be able to stand up to the German juggernaut at first. Um, talk to us about where the idea of writing the book came from for you. Uh, that's a great question. I, 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 um, first of all, I was born in July 30th, 1939. I was born 31 days before uh, the invasion, uh, uh, was the, 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 when the war began, when Poland was invaded by the Nazis. And um, as a kid, I grew up with two uncles in service, both in the Pacific, both in combat zones, one in the Air Corps. Uh, and one in the Navy, he was a CB, which was Construction Battalion, which is the, the sort of the engineering arm of the, ar the Navy. But he would go in on ships that were sinking and try to patch them up and keep them from going down. It was, it was heroic, tough work. So I spent the war as a little kid, my, uh, fascinated by, worried about my uncles. Uh, I woke up every night or went to bed every night and prayed for my uncles. Uh, my parents at that time got both Look Magazine and Life Magazine, which for anybody of our age or your age uh, will know were intensely pictorial. So as a little kid, even before I could read, I would be looking at these pictures of the war and horrified, horrified by uh, what was going on and, and trying to, and they, my only way to relate it was to my, to my uncles and to the people around me. We were surrounded by people in, in our neighborhood, Yonkers, New York, where I grew up, oh, there were sons and daughters uh, were, were in the service. And uh, it was compelling. And then I remember one morning in particular, I walked down the street, and there was an apartment building down my um, the street where I lived, and there was a first floor apartment, and there was this gold star in the window. And I knew what that meant. It, was, it meant that the, the mother, it was a gold star mother, uh, a star, and what that meant is that that mother had lost a son a, a, in the war. And that really brought it home. So for the rest of my life, up until this point, until um, I've been fascinated by the war, read an awful lot about it, and always tried to put it together. And in 2005, I got sort of fascinated with the fact, I got really looking at things like, how do we get prepared for the war? Because I had always been told, and, and many people today will actually believe, that it was only after Pearl Harbor that we built this enormous army. And the more I looked into it, and the more I studied it, the more I realized that there was this huge pre-story that, that nobody has really put together as a coherent whole. And it involved uh, this, the, the key moments, there were some very key moments. And it was interesting to me what made it more relevant almost by the day was this was this creation of this army, the leadership, the mobility, the ability to handle logistics, all of the things we needed for Europe and Asia, all the things we needed to win the war, were in fact, um, they had begun during this period. We learned all this stuff. And we learned it through the, the, the early draftees. And um, th this, th I just, and it was done during, in an intensely divided nation. They were so-called interventionists who wanted to stop the war, uh, intercede, and the isolationists. And the isolationists are very powerful. And they were almost today, there, there was a deep, deep division in the country. So this miracle, which I, the more I look back on it, the miracle was putting together this army. And one of the interesting things was when the draft goes in in the fall of 1940, um, there's this huge moment where, where everybody's drafted. Roosevelt's sons, Rockefellers, Vanderbilts, the head of the New York Stock Exchange, heads of major law firms up and down the line are drafted and sent to these godforsaken bases. And I say it clearly because they had very little recreation, often in the middle of nowhere in the West or in the South, often without even a swimming pool or anything to speak of. Uh, sent off to these places at a, you know, at a very, very low monthly, $21 a month, and sent into basic training. And there was very little resistance. The, the, the main resistance was, was religious on the part of pacifists and, and uh, people who were at that level of, of, of their perception of the world. There were Jehovah's Witnesses and others. 
but the, but the general grumbling of a peacetime draft and these people, men being pulled out of their jobs and pulled out of their houses and pulled away from their families. Um, and, you, and you fast forward to the day, I'm, I, I'm editorializing here, but you fast forward to the day to the people screaming about, they can't force me to wear a mask. But back then it was, you're gonna go to war and we don't have a war started yet. So, so I just, all of that stuff came together for me. And, and the more I got into it, the stronger I felt that this was, a, if not an untold story, an unrealized story. That's terrific. So why, let's dive into the book a little bit. Um, talk about what happened to the U.S. Army at the end of World War I. Well, essentially, the Army was sent home. And it was sent home, and it was a mess. Uh, it was a lot of guys went home. They got virtually no money coming out. Uh, they were often given, uh, and they've been able to save no money. If you're in World War I, you were basically paid a dollar a day for civilian service and a dollar and a quarter a day for overseas service, including combat. Uh, you had to buy your own uniforms. You had, uh, you, if you wanted a calibrated rifle, you had to buy, pay, pay for it. Uh, there was this whole business that was very unfair. So they, all of a sudden they dumped them. They literally just sent them home. And that led eventually to uh, the Bonus Army of 1932 when the veterans themselves had become so exasperated. Uh, they, were, they were offered a bonus earlier, but it would only come due in 1945. They would say, well, it was the argument that the army made at the time or the, the, general, the people coming out of service was, if I'd worked in a shipyard, I'd get 10 to 15 times what I got in the army. Uh, and so th there was a, it was a tremendous uh, up upheaval led later, I mean, if we fast forward, it was the treatment of the guys in World War I who were basically with the prompt or the catalyst for the GI Bill. They couldn't, they realized this time they couldn't throw off, you know, four, four million men or five million men, whatever the number was, overnight and just say, you go back to society and find a job and find a house and find this. And so, but, but World War I was a mess. And and they basically the army fell apart. They, they, they just kept very little army. By the time of 1935, when, uh, when uh, Patton was secretary of the army, uh, army secretary, uh, he said the United States army was, could fit in Yankee Stadium and it was not prepared to fight. In 1935, it, it could, the whole army could fit in the, the Yankee Stadium. The day the war was declared in, uh, or the war began in Poland, the invasion of Poland, the United States ranked 17th in the world in terms of military power. They were after Portugal uh, and they were after Poland. Poland then, when Poland was destroyed, uh, we, we, I guess we went up to 16th, but it was, we were not, we were allowed, we were a poor power, we were not trained. And again, the, the business, the, the, there are many, many examples of how badly the army was in 1939 at the beginning of the war. But just one example kills me. If you went in the army in that, during that period and you wanted a gun uh, that was calibrated, one that actually worked, you had to pay over $200 to buy the gun from the army. Otherwise, they just gave you a lousy old gun that hadn't been tested probably wasn't maintained. You had to fix it up yourself. So you had to pay for it on an installment plan. You're getting 21 bucks a month. You had to buy your own gun for every time. It was, it was a colossally horrible organization. They didn't want, enlisted men weren't allowed, they were almost forced not to marry. They couldn't, they were, they were uh, they, they, their costs of just living in the army were extraordinary. And the only reason they could keep any major number in the army at all even though it was a small number, was that uh, the depression was going on, and at least they knew they'd get three meals a day. I was going to ask what um, uh, uh, what the impact of the of the depression was. You you might think that that people would gravitate toward military service um, at that time, for as as you just mentioned, um, room and board effectively, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, no, it's, it was room and board, and, and sometimes it was security. Sometimes it was to get away from a, a big problem you had with a, a, say, a family problem or uh, 
you'd been in trouble with the, with the, with the law and you wanted to sort of erase that criminal record or something, you, would, you could go in and you sort of change your identity. Talk about the, um, the forces that opposed creating an army capable of fighting in, in World War II. Was it just isolationists? Um, uh, what, what were some of the other factors uh, in that? Well, there were there, there are several. One was the the uh, there was a great in the th in the 30s, especially in the 30s, there was a great disillusion with with World War One. There was a, an antagonism towards going to war. The American Legion, among other people, were opposed to what you were going to war in Europe. Uh, the college groups were forming, anti-war groups were forming, some of which uh, had sort of a humorous overtone, but they were quite serious. Uh, there was a thing called the Veterans of Future Wars, where a bunch of Princeton students started this, this deal where they were demanding their veterans benefits in advance of the next war. They wanted to be paid then for their, for their service. And uh, it seemed crazy, but it spread like wildfire. And all of a sudden, there, there, there are veterans of future wars uh, all over the country. Every campus in the country had a chapter. And there was this, this malaise with the idea that World War I, you know, uh, there was a song like uh, about a bumblebee, I've been stung once, but not, not be stung again. And that was, the, so it was that element, just as sort of abhorrence towards war. And the other was this, uh, this very strongly uh, oriented group which was eventually going to be led by Charles Lindbergh, the, the, uh, the uh, aviation hero, uh, uh, that was opposed to war and, and almost to anything to do with Europe, anything to do with invention, anything to do with stopping the Nazis. The, that group believed strongly, they was, called themselves the American Firsters. They believed that we're almost, would argue almost abandoning the army except for coastal defense and strengthening the Navy. But just they believed strongly that the two oceans kept us from uh, any kind of attack. And so all we needed was a strong art and Navy and forget about the Army. Let it just be these little coastal things and some of the territories having the Army there, but minimize the Army. And they became more and more strident and more and more powerful and included some really interesting people, including Lindbergh and Walt Disney and Teddy Roosevelt's son and a number of people, um, and they stumbled at the last minute. One of the one of the phenomenal things that happened to them was Lindbergh, uh, very late in, in 41, right before Pearl, I think closer to Pearl Harbor, he made this horrible mistake. His wife advised him against it, but he gave this anti-Semitic speech in which he claimed the American Jewish population was almost like a foreign power trying to involve this in war, treating him almost as a separate nation. And it and he went into every trope of anti-Semitism that they control the media and they were this and that. His wife begged him not to give the speech. She said, this is going to destroy you. And what Lindbergh didn't realize was the number of, of Jewish people who were actually in the America First movement to begin with, but the major station that was carrying all of Lindbergh's America First uh, 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 speeches and, and, and diatribes was the Mutual Network, which is owned by a guy named Bamberger, who was a department store owner in New Jersey, famously for Bamberger's department stores, but he owned the network. And he just goes crazy. He said, wait a second, what, you're coming after us? And we're, we're trying to do everything we can to support the country. And, and so they, they went down and this flames that brought them down were brought on by themselves. But Marshall and Roosevelt and the rest of them, Stimson, Secretary of War, and, and Knox, Secretary of the Navy, they were always fighting against this group that was trying to destroy uh, any attempt to get at the, ar the uh, army on, on its footing. You had um, a great description of the resistance of the upper echelon of the army to modernize, uh, even to give up horses. Um, talk about what their thinking was. and. Um, and uh, I think you've mentioned some, but talk about the people who finally overcame it. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, the anti-tank thing was extraordinary. And, if, and the, and the pro-tank people were, uh, even though he's a great horseman, Patton was one of the, one of the great horsemen uh, of his time, uh, 
but there but there was this resist they wanted to keep the they wanted to keep the horses and eisenhower said in his memoir dwight d eisenhower said in his memoir if you if you said anything that was anti-cavalry meaning the mounted cavalry not the armored cavalry which was tanks but if you said anything about the mounted cavalry uh, your career was in jeopardy you might you might be uh, disciplined severely and any officer went against the armored uh, and I, what happened, I think, more than more than anything else, was on the ground, as they got into these maneuvers, which we'll probably talk about in a second. These grand maneuvers in Louisiana. They began in Tennessee. Uh, they went to uh, Louisiana, which was almost over half a million men, and then to the Carolinas. Uh, uh, they began to realize that they couldn't move the horses, and they started moving the horses in vans from one place to the other. The, the cavalry performed well, but it could it wasn't mobile, and it you couldn't you couldn't move it you couldn't, and it and and, and when when you started to see the value of the tanks, there was just no question when especially under Patton's leadership the first armored division comes out of nowhere and just starts showing the the, the speed and the alacrity and all the things you can do with tanks, and they're pretty much done for by Carolina late forty one, they they become. There's one or two times they're used during the war, but they're pretty much ceremonial by the end of 1941, the, the horse cavalry. And the Germans show that, that armored units were a key to fighting this war. So we had to take a lesson from them, right? Yeah, and, then the, and we relearned real early the term Blitzkrieg. Uh, I mean, that was, we, we, we started studying the, the brighter members, and there were quite a few of them, the brighter members of the armed forces, and they're all the guys that become the great heroes of World War II. And I'm talking about Omar Bradley. I'm talking about Mark Clark. I'm talking about Dwight D. Eisenhower. I'm talking about well, these guys, uh, and Patton, of course. These, these men began to realize the absolute value of the tank, but also began to realize how important mobility was. So one of the things, it's not just to get, but to be able to get the tanks to the battlefield, which was one, but th then became gasoline because our tanks were not diesel powered. They were powered with, you know, service station gasoline and getting uh, the mobility included not only being able to move the troops, but in Louisiana, they were going through two million eggs a day. They were going through, there were tank cars with potable water because they were fighting in the swamps where you couldn't drink the water, but you would drink, there were these lines of tankers coming into Louisiana to bring water to the troops. It was almost like a pipeline of trucks. And so part of it was learning to, to do the, the, the um, me mechanized cavalry, which was the, uh, the tanks, but also the logistics that went along with it. And when we went to, at the end of the war, Eisenhower said, uh, we, we, if we hadn't learned all that in Louisiana and Carolinas, um, if the war in war, Europe would have bogged down. So, the ability to move that amount of stuff. So now you, we've, we've touched on it uh, a couple, three times. Uh, tell us more about these, these massive uh, dress rehearsals for the war that, that took place in the spring and the summer and the fall of 1941 in Tennessee and Louisiana and the Carolinas. Well, when, once we started drafting the troops in 1940, in the fall of 1940, and sending them to these bases. There were thousands and hundreds of thousands of, of men uh, being drafted and then others following as volunteer draftees. They were, they were being pumped into these camps, ill-equipped. Uh, they were building barracks. Many of them had to go through the winter in cold weather, sleeping in tents. Uh, the winter of 40-41 was just terrible. And the morale was cascading downwards because a guy had been Let's say being taken out of his job as an architect, he's drafted, he's sent to a, a base in Texas or Oklahoma or Montana or somewhere, uh, and he gets there, his, his salary's been cut to nothing. Um, he gets up in the morning at five o'clock, he drills for a couple hours, he goes to a class or two, at, by the two o'clock in the afternoon, there's nothing for him to do but read comic books and moan about the fact that not getting any new movies on the base. So the morale is, 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 is cascading downwards as they just put these guys in these bases. They, they're not, there's not, they, they don't, they're never in the field. They're stuck in these bases and these 
godforsaken barracks, which are being erected, you know, over almost overnight, and sometimes without sewer, and sometimes and they're just horrible places. Marshall and the other leaders in the army realize he's got to get him in the field. He's got to move him out. He's got to move into a thing, and they've got to go into a mock warfare. They've got to be they've got to be brought together as units. They've got to travel as units. They've got to learn tactics as units. And not just of some abstraction with a blackboard, but really engaging one another. It starts in Tennessee. It's this massive uh, event. Uh, and it, it, there are many funny stories about it, but it, many people in Tennessee, it was in rural Tennessee, had never seen a motorcycle before, had never seen an airplane before. But all of this is brought in and they fight these battles. They, they warm up to this massive battle in uh, war that goes on for six weeks in, in Louisiana and then end up in the Carolinas, which, which are again, massive. Um, but before it all, it's over, over almost a million, 890,000 men are involved, reservists and that regular army. But what it, what it teaches that they learn during this period, what they learn during this period is an immense amount of ability to, because when they start, uh, nobody's really tested these guys. And what they find when these guys are in there, these draftees, they have two amazing abilities that they didn't have in World War I, which sound very primitive when I explain them. One is these guys had all grown up with cars. So the first time they saw a tank, the first time they saw a Jeep, the first time they saw an airplane, their, their inclination was to dive under the hood and start souping it up and playing with the spark plugs, and et cetera. The other thing, and this is, this when I, when I, when I discovered this, I said, I'm, this is wonderful. They knew how to read maps. One of the reasons in World War I, you had lost battalions and you had these huge problems of, of, of inability. People didn't know how to read maps. They had a, maybe in school, they had a big map of the world, but they didn't know how to read a topographical map. They didn't know how to read a street map. But the guys that were brought in in 1940, 41, uh, had been, they'd grown up with gas station, free gas station road maps. They, really, they were familiar with maps. Maps were their second. There's little kids, they'd go to the gas station and pick up a map and figure out all the small towns in Indiana. So, so they were, they, and they were a spirited guy, the uh, group. Uh, when they got, they got them out in the field, they caught competing and they start you know, having, you know, in runs and have to build these pontoon bridges overnight, uh, their morale starts increasing. They start becoming more and more of units and they've got great leadership. And one of the things sitting back in Washington is, uh, is the secretary of the army. Um, and he realizes that some of these guys aren't any good. He sees a large group of his officers cannot, do not perform. They're either alcoholic, they neither they can't get along with their with their men. Uh, they don't have any sense of logistics or supply. So he purges. He hated the word. Marshall hated the word. But in the early fall of 41, you know, that start, starting in September of 41, he purges hundreds, and I say hundreds of senior officers. Now, some of them he'll send it to places where they're harmless, a supply base. Some of them he's asked to leave the armed force. He realized he's got to get rid of these guys if he's going to win the war. And in their place, in their place, he's got this, it's uh, a list, uh, it's, the list is probably in his head, but a list of young officers who he see can win the war. And, and, and this, again, it's Mark Clark, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, Eisenhower, it's Patton, um, it's Omar Bradley. It's Gunther, it's on and on, Joe Stilwell. It, it goes on and on and on. And this is the group of guys that he brings up into, into the, into the, so the maneuvers have provided him with A, morale building, learning logistics, learning tactics, uh, and, and, and getting the press. The press covers the Louisiana maneuvers like nothing you've ever seen. And, and it gets America prepared for following a war, following war maneuvers. And, and, the, and the, the, the reporters, the Severides, the John Daly's, the uh, Dave Garraway's, all these people we hear about after the war, um, many of Moreau's boys, Hotlip is there. Um, they're reporting this like it's a real war, these maneuvers. And, and um, 
and they're and they're and they've got they they've gotten the country sort of involved in how this is going to be fought, and um, it's a great story of how the the army embraced rather than dismiss or uh, uh, they embrace the press and and actually put them in uniform, and someone like Severide becomes a major factor in the in the morale. Eric Severide, who was at people in the press club, remember was. It, uh, my great story about Eric Severide in the press club is when he goes into the big, big ballroom for the first time, he's giving when the new ballroom opened. I was there and Severide looks up and, and to those who don't in the press club, the, the ceiling is sort of rippled with, with wood. And he said, now I know what it's like to speak inside a desk. That was the roof of the ceiling of the press club. That, that's an aside, this is the press club inside thing. But, um, but, it, but the, the maneuvers became uh, the, the setup for this war, and 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 um, we we came out of it with with men over a, you know one point almost a one point five million man army that was ready to go. They were well led, and and even the business of the purge. The purge becomes as the war progresses, the purge becomes more important because uh, Marshall has Eisenhower show up in Washington two weeks after Pearl Harbor. Brings them to Washington. They never even met, I think, except maybe once at a, uh, at a party or something. He brings Eisenhower to Washington, knows that Eisenhower, because of his ability to get along with his men, along with the press, his, his brain, he's grooming him to run the war and uh, the, the invasion of Europe. He's, in, he's grooming him two weeks after uh, Pearl Harbor, or he starts to groom him. Uh, the, as the war's going on, H.G. Wells, the famous writer, was also a military, wrote about the military as well as, you know, War of the Worlds and the books we know about, we remember in war. He writes about the purge in one of the British papers, and he says, you know, the Americans, the French and the British did not purge. They did not get rid of the, of the, of the bad officers. And I use the word bad carefully, but, but Many of, again, alcoholics, people who demonstrably could not get along with their own men, which is, which is a major factor in war. Um, he said that, that the United States made a tremendous advance on their, on their own side by purging the bad guys. Uh, and and uh, he said, unfortunately, the Nazis did the same thing. They got rid of the, the, the low inferior officers, but, but um, and he said one of the problems the British had and the French had was they hadn't gotten rid of the bad officers and that hurt them. And this was from a British guy. This wasn't from some, you know, some, somebody taking pot shots. Uh, so so it, it, it formed our, it, we, it had us ready to go. Thank you. Um, in addition to this being today, the 75th anniversary, of VJ Day and essentially the end of, of World War II, we're commemorating this year the centennial of radio, which began right. commercial operation in 1920. And you've talked about the press, you've mentioned Ed Murrow, Eric Severide, the Murrow Boys. Dan Rather was here earlier this week and we had a wonderful right. conversation with Dan. And uh, he talked about Murrow's reports from London during the during the Blitz that helped galvanize support in the United States for the development of, of our own defense. And your first interview as a teen was with Robert Trout, uh, who anchored the CBS World News Roundup um, each night that included Murrow's reports and those of his team, uh, who became known as the Murrow Boys. Um, talk about the impact of radio during that period, because as, as, as Others who lived through it um, have said it was the internet and television and radio and a lot of media all rolled into one, and that was its importance in America at the time. It's, it's very hard to understand the, the degree to which radio was important in the, not only in the, of course, during the war itself, that's been remarkably well demonstrated, uh, but, but in that pre-war period, there were several things that you can jump into. Uh, and I'll, uh, one of which was Severide's reporting. Severide 
is there's a whole team in Louisiana. CBS sent down 22 reporters, uh, Robert Daly, Severide, uh, a whole 22, including an actor. They bring Burgess Meredith, who was a big star on Broadway, then to be sort of the melodramatic voice that would then announce, because they treated the daily battles down there as if they were a, a radio drama. They would do it. And, the, and they would have a, one reporter on the Blue Army, one reporter on the Red Army. So they would be, the reporters would be talking back and forth about we did this, we did that. But the, but the importance was phenomenal. The number of radio reporters were down there from the, not only the networks, but from the local stations. And um, uh, the most famous one that uh, NBC sent down was Dave Garraway, the early, early uh, host of the Today Show. Uh, uh, but, um, and there were, again, a lot of, lot of re bi really big names. But Samurai was the most important because he started to report. There's a lot of question about whether these guys were ready to fight. And Samurai does this one report one, one night, and he's watching these paratroopers argue with the judges in this, in this battle. And he, and he realizes these guys and the paratroopers are being disqualified because of some technicality. It's a war game, so there's not real casualties. So you have judges. So what happens is Severi watches these guys and realizes they really want to win. It's like a, he's, he compares it to a high school basketball game. He said, these guys have the spirit. They're going to win this war. And then he watches them and he watches them. And instead of saying, well, these guys aren't, you know, they, they don't clean up after themselves or whatever. He, he caught, watched them as a fighting force. And he goes on the radio the night of Pearl Harbor. Or, and he, and he asks, he's the one that makes the big announcement at Pearl Harbor on CBS. And he goes to bed that night. He writes in his diary that he goes to bed that night sleeping soundly. He said, I know we're going to win. I know these men are, are capable of winning. And that's what he wrote about it. So that was important. But the other factor of radio, which I which I can't, I, I just thought was amazing, was Bob Hope, who basically goes through the whole war on radio, but he's all over the world reporting and doing his show with with the, with the comedians and the other people from Bob Hope. And at one point in the war, and this 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 was one of the story, stories that just blew me away. At one point in the war. Hope is in the, the United States Army is going from North Africa into Italy, into Sicily. And uh, they're, they're taking heavy casualties. It's a very difficult time getting them across to, into, into Sicily. And Hope is right there. And a reporter for the New York Herald Tribune says, when this, and he's watching Hope. And Hope is going in, into these wards where the kids are really horribly hurt. And, and he's He's basically doing this very, very tough job of keeping morale up and telling jokes and, 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 and really doing this remarkable job and, and putting his own life at risk. And the reporter is John Steinbeck, that John Steinbeck, the John Steinbeck of, of Grapes of Wrath. And, and, and Steinbeck is then writing for the New York Herald Tribune and he says, the lead to his piece is this, it says, when a history of this war is written, one of the true heroes will be Bob Hope. And I thought that was, you know, that was just like one of these things where you, anybody declares you're a hero and it's signed back as a war correspondent. But that was, radio was everything. And, if, and you know, as I said before, I grew up during that period and every night on the radio was terribly important to sit down and listen to it and, and to get the report and that CBS and, and not, it wasn't just, CBS was the most important one. And, and I, one of my favorite books is Lynn Olson's book called The Morrow Boys, which is about, which is a great, great, great book. Um, but but it was it was everybody. It was mutual. It was NBC. It was there were and there were independent stations that did tremendous work during that period. KDKA in Pittsburgh and others, where they had their own you know uh, feeds and their own uh, own, own, own coverage. So, uh, but it was terribly important. I guess it's hard to think about that today because radio is being eclipsed by podcasts and things like that. Well, it's terrific. And you mentioned uh, the Merle Boys book by Stanley Cloud and Lynn Olson. And uh, it is uh, perhaps the, the finest book about the Merle Boys and, uh, and, uh, and their work in World War II. Um, just a terrific book. I, I did want to ask you because you, uh, we, we learned that you interviewed uh, 
uh, America's first anchorman, Bob Trout, when you were in the ninth grade. Do you remember what you talked with him about when you interviewed him? <laughs> no, I was, what happened was, and it was a, I was in junior high school, Nathaniel Hawthorne Junior High School in Yonkers, New York. And I was working for the school magazine called the Chanticleer, which had a, you know, a, a, a rooster on the cover. And uh, I, I they, they, somehow I got this, applied for this thing for young journalists at Columbia Journalism School. Columbia had this thing for high school and occasionally junior high school kids who could apply for and then go to this uh, school for, for a long, it was a long weekend. It was all over one of the holiday weekends, but it was a three day weekend. And you went down and you, you you went to classes and you talked to people and they set you up with interviews. And the two I remember was Herbert Philbrick, who wrote a book called I Led Three Lives, who was a counter spy. And they were they later a television show. It was a counter anti communist counter spy who spied for the Russians and spied for us. And and that was interesting because it was it was the that period of the Cold War. But then I just talked to Trout about being a journalist and about what it was like in World War II. I, and it was pretty pedestrian because I was just this, I mean, I'm in ninth grade, you know? And so I'm, I'm up and I heard this guy on the radio. It wasn't like they were throwing me in the room with somebody that I was, you know, I knew him like, if you're walking down the street and there's somebody you see on television, you know, you see David, David Letterman in the middle of Fifth Avenue, New York City, You've watched him so often that you think he he knows who you are. Sure. Well, that's what I felt about Trout was I'd listen to him so often that I that I sort of felt I knew him on one level, but that he should know me because I listened, you know, you know the, the drill. But um that is just charming. It was the other thing in those days, I guess it's still true today, but guys like that, they didn't have this aura of pre pretense and in inapproachability they were a very approachable that trout would spend you know all, all of his saturday listening to kids and i mean he used to turn kids advisedly boys and girls we call them back again interviewing him and asking stupid questions asking him not so stupid questions but he had that patience he had that you know and, and it, it, he became heroic for me in that regard that's wonderful you mentioned burgess meredith uh uh, during the maneuvers when an actor was brought in and it just brought back to mind that Burgess Meredith actually portrayed Ernie Pyle in the in the film uh, the story of G.I. Joe and uh, yeah, to, yeah. to a later generation Burgess Meredith was known as the uh, the trainer for Sylvester Stallone in Rocky in the latter That's part right. of his life uh, so he was uh, he was around for a good long time we have some questions from uh, some of the folks that are tuning in online today and uh, here's a question from Rick Anderson. Can you speak to Lieutenant General Leslie McNair's role in preparing the Army for World War II? His role is often overlooked when discussing pre-war, early war preparation. Well, I, he is discussed in the book and he is, he is absolutely fundamental to getting us ready. And he was an organizational genius at that level. And so uh, his input was absolutely colossal. He had, um, he didn't have as much of a role on the ground as he did as a planner and as a theoretician. But uh, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad Mr. Atkins brought that up. And uh, we have a couple of questions from a National Press Club member, Edwin Grosvenor, uh, who's also the publisher of American Heritage Magazine. Um, there are some interesting parts in your book about African-American soldiers, and you seem to have um, called a, a fair amount of your information from the black press. Uh, could you talk about that as a source of your information? Yeah, the, one of the great things that's happened in this age of digitalization uh, is that you can, you, some of the newspapers that were, uh, you could only access through micro, microfilm and that was often difficult because you had to find a library that had microfilm. Uh, they've digitized the, the black press, which is a major force going into World War II. And the black press was behind the effort to integrate the army. The army of 1939, 40, 41 was a Jim Crow army. And A. Philip Randolph, among others, fought with the president, fought with the secretary of war uh, to get the army integrated. And that became the counter narrative to the book because they uh, were at one point Randolph uh, 
proposes, he's so angry that they're not integrating the armed forces nor defense industries, that he plans a march on Washington, claims he will have 100,000 um, African-Americans march on Washington on July 1st, 1941. And finally, Roosevelt convinces them to drop the plan. It's a plan he will then push aside until the famous wa wa March on Washington later. But Randolph was then probably the most pr predominant uh, uh, African-American on the scene. He was the head of the sleeping car por uh, porters union, a trade union, but he was also the voice of of integration and civil rights at that time. And Roosevelt convinces him to drop the plans for the march and then says he's going to integrate the, the defense industries, well, but will not integrate the armed forces. And that that is that is the, the counter narrative is the most negative thing because the, the, uh, the whole war, <clears throat> the black troops, who are significantly not high number, the so black troops uh, were fighting for equality, fighting, and they, and they had the motto, which had been created by one of the black papers, which was double V, which is victory over fascism, victory over Jim Crow, which was the word, was the slang word of that time for segregation. Jim Crow was the system of, of segregation. And it doesn't really get resolved until, until uh, President Truman is more or less forced into integrating the army. Uh, by executive order, but even that is is not um, complete, and it would it really takes Eisenhower and Kennedy to enforce it to really really bring that change. And it's not until 50 years after the Truman Edict that Secretary of Defense then Cohen, Secretary of Defense Cohen, says 50 years after it, he said the army and the military is now integrated. It is it is probably the best integrated element of American life. But that's the subtitle. There's a lot in the book about the struggles of black uh, people during the war and an extraordinary contribution. In fact, there's one famous story where there is a black unit in Massachusetts, uh, all black unit, black officers, uh, crack back. It's a, it's a reserve unit. They're not allowed to come to the maneuvers. They're disinvited from the maneuvers because they're so afraid that if a black colonel shows up in the maneuvers, a, a, a white lieutenant's going to have to salute him. Or a white. And so they were so afraid of that, that integration that they kept this crack unit out of the maneuvers. So you have this country that just can't learn to, to integrate. And, and that's, the, that's, the bad, that's the counter narrative. That's the sad part of the story. And I try to give as much air as I can in telling you. Thank you. Um, we have one other question from Edwin Grosvenor. Um, how did Marshall discover Colonel Eisenhower and promote him uh, over many other more senior officers? Uh, he he had his eyes on Eisenhower for a long time, and he and he was watching him through reports, and he was watching again. It was his ability to get along with. A, the press, because in Louisiana, a lot of the uh, officers didn't want to talk to the press or they would talk to them in such highly technical terms that they couldn't understand it. Eisenhower had this easy way about him. He was brilliant. And, and Marshall even tests him one time and asks him what he would do about certain situations. Eisenhower sits down with a yellow pad and comes back in an hour with an analysis of a, of a situation. He realizes he's brilliant, but he also has this extraordinary ability to lead and to get along with his men. It's, it's almost singular, his ability to be loved by those under him. Not love, maybe love's too strong a word, but deeply respected and admired and has this affection for other people. I mean, the great, there's one story in, in Eisenhower, in Louisiana, he sent out, to, there's this cook out there that's that spite his complaints that this guy's food is too spicy. So he goes out and checks with his cook and he says, yeah, I used to work in a restaurant in New York and I bought some <clears throat> this, on, I got a little paprika, I bought all the spices on my own. And I from, had always been a great cook, I loved to cook. And so he gets to be pals with this guy. So when he's head of the, after the war, he brings this cook, this army cook into cook for him at, at, at the headquarters. In, in Europe. 
And then the guy goes and starts a restaurant in New York called the headquarters, the HQ, which was which was based on the Macri's Heights. But Eisenhower had the ability to basically not only just he was sent to discipline this cook, but he ends up becoming his friend. And there's this, there's this, uh, I think a marshal who was discovered the same way up Roosevelt went down, I think 22 people in the seniority list to pick Marshall. And it, above him were some people that really would have turned out very badly with, but he realized that very early on, Roosevelt realized the genius of Marshall. So this 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 pecking order where, you know, Roosevelt sees Marshall, Roosevelt sees Stimson as his secretary of war, um, Marshall sees Eisenhower and Patton and Grunther and all the whole crew. And it's, it's a question of, People making really, really, really good decisions. The 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 counterweight to the way uh, the uh, soldiers felt about Eisenhower, uh, maybe uh, in this in this story, um, I had the the pleasure of working with Andy Rooney at, at CBS News, and uh, Andy appeared on a program I was producing shortly after the death of the actor George C. Scott, and Andy yeah. Rooney said. I hated George C. Scott, and uh, we asked why, and he said, because I served under Patton, and I hated Patton, and he said, and George C. Scott did such a good job of playing Patton in the movies that I came to hate George C. Scott. <laughs> that was his view of George C. Oh, Scott. no, I, I, and Patton, Patton does these crazy things. The other one, he tries to stop. He tries to actually bring him to his knees, stop him, is Bill Mould and the cartoonist who is depicting these these soldiers as guys with their unstrapped helmets and they're yeah. they're smoking cigarettes and they're you know they're complaining and and Patton is furious and he goes to the highest level to get get uh, his stuff taken out of Stars and Stripes, which was the magazine that uh, the newspaper that Rooney worked for as well. And Rooney's in the book is you know a young kid at Colgate being drafted, of course in Hamilton, I forget, but. But it, but it was one of the upper New York State schools. But uh, but and it's Eisenhower who finally says, no, no, you can't get rid of Malden. The troops love him. No, and he overrules uh, Patton, who's furious. So we have a, a related question from uh, Jody Beck. Um, what's your opinion of MacArthur's contribution to preparations as Army Chief of Staff in the 30s and in the Philippines? Uh, no, there's not he not much. I mean, I think the most brilliant thing he ever did. He did one major thing that was extraordinary. When Eisenhower, when Roosevelt comes into office, first thing he wants to do is create this massive civilian conservation corps, a tree army, an army of out of work, poor uh, men who would go out and replant the forest, re fix the dust bowl by replanting build golf courses, build mountain trails, uh, uh, recreate the country. And um, uh, Roosevelt's about to start this thing and he realizes he has nobody to run it. So he goes to MacArthur and says to MacArthur, will you, will the army run the Civilian Conservation Corps? And um, MacArthur says, yeah, if you don't cut my officer corps. He's, Roosevelt was about to cut the officer corps by about a third. And it would have probably gotten rid of the same guys again, Eisenhower, Patton, Mark Clark, Omar Bradley. But by, by making this deal with Roosevelt, he gets to keep his guys. All those guys that I just mentioned, um, Marshall included, end up running massive CCC camps. And what they learn in these CCC camps is how to discipline men without punishment. Because if you tell a CCC guy, to pick up a cigarette butt, he says, no, the hell with you, and he walks off, he's gone. So he had, they had to, they, all these leaders had to learn, and, and, and Marshall has this extraordinary experience running tens of thousands of these men who respect him deep, deeply, but he does things like he gets them great dental care, he convinces dentists to work on these kids' teeth. And so the, the army itself becomes uh, emboldened by this, by this uh, bill experience with the CCC. Plus, and uh, Mark Clark says this after the war, they become the backbone, the CCC guys who come out, their teeth are fixed, they're, they're in much better 
spirits. They, they, they know how to run a drill. They know how to run a formation. They know how to obey orders. They become the backbone of the non-commissioned officer corps in World War II. They become the backbone. And those that didn't go in the war, they become the factory foreman in the, in the, in the aircraft factories and stuff. And Clark says it was the CCC guys who, not single-handedly, but were one of the reasons we won the war when we did. Um, That's great. Um, Ken Burns uh, joined us a few weeks ago, and uh, he told the club that one of the high points of American history was D-Day, when uh, GIs were willing to storm ashore at Normandy, not for territorial gain, but to end Nazi oppression of other people. What would you say uh, was it in the development of the GI Army that fostered that kind of commitment? I, it's a very difficult question to answer, but, but I will take a, I'll take a, 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 a perhaps futile stab at it. I think they realized they were a citizen army. They were not a professional army. They were there to defend their country, their families, their wives, their children, their parents. And they were there to, to win the war for the country. And they, they never lost sight, nor did anybody else lose sight of the fact this was not a professional army. This was not uh, an army that had been developed uh, entirely out of West Point or entirely out of the system. These were guys that had been yanked out of their lives. And they, they had to win it. They just couldn't. They, they, they envisioned a, country, a world in which the Nazis and the, and the Japanese, would, the warlords, would prevail. And I think it's the same thing that got the guys when the first Americans go ashore, when the first Americans go ashore in North Africa. I think it's the same moment. I think these guys know that they're, 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 they're facing these Nazis who have been on the ground, Rummel and his crew, uh, and they've got to go into North Africa. And they're, they're, they're a virgin army. They're fresh. This is in fall of 42. And they've gotten them across the Atlantic without being blown up by submarines, Nazi submarines, and they've got them bring some down that they put in North, Northern Ireland. And these guys go ashore to fight. They got they had some terrible times there. There were some slaughters of America, but they kept on going. And uh, and I think part of it was I think part of it was leadership. I think it's patriotism, and I think it was the belief, the, uh, the very real belief that they were saving not only the United States, but Western civilization. Um, and, and I think that's what, what, what was the motivation. So I'm gonna stay a little philosophical with you as we round this out. What would you say are the lessons learned from what we now call the greatest generation that lived through the, the depression, that fought World War II? And do you see some applications for today in those lessons and the types of things we're facing right now? Well, it's tough, but I do see, I mean, I think leadership is, is uh, absolutely essential. I think the top people at that time, the, 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 some of the brightest people in the country were going into the armed services to, to, for that reason. I think, um, I think leadership, I think working your way around partisanship. I mean, one of the genius things that Roosevelt did was he realized he had to bring the Republicans in. So he immediately picks Stimson as his secretary of war and a, a, a very major, major name in the uh, Republican Party. And then he picks uh, as his secretary of Navy, uh, Knox. Again, a very conservative republic. But he, but he basically creates his war cabinet around around bipartisanship and these are guys that were not these were not fans of the new deal they were not fans of the social pro programs these were people who he brought in because he knew they could win the war and stimson was one of the reasons we won the war knox is one of the reasons we won the war and then roosevelt's genius and, and steering around that bipartisan state because it was awfully it got awfully nasty out there during the with the uh isolationists. Well, we will let that be the last word for this conversation. Our thanks to journalist, author, and National Press Club member Paul Dixon, author of The Rise of the GI Army, 1940 and 41.
the forgotten story of how America forged a powerful army before Pearl Harbor. Paul, we are very pleased to present you with another National Press Club coffee mug. Uh, and uh, see, we're both holding one right now. That's great. Well, you'll have a match set. Uh, and, uh, and our sincere hope uh, that you will join us again in person uh, in the very near future. Great good luck, and thank you so much for today. This was very special. Thank you. Our thanks to our producer, Lindsay Underwood, our headliners, co-team leaders, Donna Line, Juan Leger, and Lori Russo, and our terrific National Press Club team behind the scenes here in the Broadcast Operations Center. We thank our members and guests for your great questions and for joining us today. Be well, stay safe, and have a good day.